Hello, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to start, but we are waiting the last panelist, uh, Shadi, who is currently uh, at the bathroom. So <laughs> we're going to start. Um, hello everyone, uh, thanks, thanks for coming to this panel. Uh, my name is Clément Leludec uh, and I'm working at the French Digital Council. Um, in the first place and before starting the discussion, um, I just want to say a few words on my organization and about all our, our work on digital accessibility. So the French Digital Council is an independent advisory commission which aims at proposing new regulations and public policy recommendations to the French government uh, in the field of digital affairs. Uh, it has been created in 2011 and uh, it has a college of 34 members representing different spheres, uh, academics, business, civil society and also for MPs. Um, it's currently working on a variety of topics ranging from platform economy to identity or facia facial recognition or AI. Um, as for me, I'm the policy officer in charge of accessibility uh, at the French Di Digital Council and we're currently working on a report on the state of digital accessibility in France uh, in order to propose uh, public policies recommendations to the French government. Um, to start, I um, just want to say a few words on this report and um, I think uh, this has been a hot topic because of the digitiz digitization of public services. Uh, the, the perspective of, of transposing the Open Union Directive on the accessibility requirements for products and services offers a good opportunity to raise the topic and to propose solutions. Um, uh, this, this directive notably strengthens the obligations of private companies in the European Union. Um, before that, there was also this uh, European di Directive on Accessibility Requirements in the public sector. So, from the, from the low perspective, the subject of digital accessibility is very important. Uh, in France, it's been 15 years um, that uh, every public web services should be accessible. 
but spoiler, uh, it is not. Uh, a study shows that less than 4% of public services actually are. Um, and that's why it's very important to, um, to have a reflection um, beyond um, the law. Um, among other uh, topics, uh, we worked on the lack, the lack of initials and lifelong training on digital accessibility. And to do so, we interviewed the web professionals um, and the result is that many of them declared that digital accessibility is not commonly taken into account in their process of developing websites. Um, many of them expressed their difficulties to understand accessibility obligations. Um, and by obligations, I mean some of them doesn't even know official technical standards. Um, some of them also stated that they, they finally better understood digital accessibility when they started to work closer with people with disability during the process of creating web services. Um, so based on those, uh, on those introductory remarks, um, I think the big question of this panel is how can we create a world in which every single web services is accessible and usable for everyone? Um, a, first, a first answer is given by the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, also known as WICAG, uh, developed by the Web Accessibility Initiative, um, notably in order to evaluate digital accessibility of web services. Um, we will obviously discuss uh, that point. Um, other answers include setting, setting up trainings on accessibility, for the benefit of web developers, graphic designers, content managers, etc. Um, another answer is to create more bridges between users and of course users with disability and people in charge of developing web services. And it will be another point that we will discuss. Um, to, discuss to discuss those points, uh, I invited Maria Ines Leitano, who completed a PhD in communication studies. Uh, her, her research focuses on communication through digital interfaces, uh, digital accessibility, and participatory design. And she's currently working at the um, 13, university, 13 Paris University. I also invited Mohamed Chabirawan, who is an analyst, social rights activist, and a researcher pursuing a PhD in international relations, and he is the president of the, of the Accessibility Special Interest Group of the Internet Society. And finally, I invited Shadi Abuzara, who works with the um, W3C Web Accessibility Initiative as uh, the Accessibility Strategy and Technology Specialist. Um, and he coordinates accessibility priorities in the W3C Strategy Team. Um, so I think we'll start the discussion with some initial remarks from the panelists. Um, let's begin with... Uh, uh, with Shadi, if you want to. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, w w we've heard the, the, the web content accessibility guidelines and all these technical stuff, but let me uh, t take a step back. Uh, there are four guiding principles in this, uh, and, and this applies to when you're making any digital technology accessible. Is it perceivable? Is the information that is provided, can I perceive it in different senses? So if I cannot see the content, can I hear it? Uh, can I touch it through Braille or something like this? Is it operable? Can I operate it in different mechanisms? If I cannot use the keyboard, can I use voice? Um, can I use a mouse? Uh, if I cannot use a mouse and so on. Um, now increasingly with touch screens and many other kind of input devices, brain-computer interaction, these kind of things. Is the content understandable to the broadest audience? So here, understandable is a very, very important criterion. Many content you know, studies show that it's not only about accessibility, it's not only about people with disabilities um, that are having um, challenges, but it actually applies to a much broader audience, and particularly in the area of understandability. And finally, robust. Does the content work well with different devices? Um, for example, somebody who's not using 
the traditional, quote unquote, traditional software that you're expecting, but using maybe some specialized assistive technologies. And if you think about these four guiding principles, whenever you're creating any content, any digital applications, um, you know, that will get you very far away. Having said that, um, that's one part of the issue, the technical standards, the technical applications. But what we also see, I'm going to refer to that statistic that was just mentioned, about 4% only, you know, um, um, even though there's been rules and regulations for maybe 15 years now, um, as, as, as was told. Um, we see that big part of that is lack of education, lack of awareness, lack of knowledge how to apply these principles. They're sometimes much more easier than you think. Um, for example, making sure that you have good color combinations so that the color contrast uh, you know, is not only for people who have visual disabilities or uh, people with color perception, disabilities as it's formally called, uh, in which uh, I think statistics say one in four uh, adult males uh, have color perceptions, uh, uh, disabilities, so uh, let's look around the room, that's quite a few of us uh, <laughs> that would be impacted by that, uh, regardless if it's labeled disability or not. Um, so, so despite many of these requirements being actually a fairly low-hanging fruit and fairly easy to integrate in a design and development process, we still see designers and developers not doing that um, due to partially lack of awareness. Um, we, we heard um, also, Clement just mentioned, developers not even knowing that these uh, standards exist, that these guidelines, how to do that. Not having the necessary expertise and skills because they have not been educated and taught. Um, and so it's really a combination. I think, you know, many organizations, we, we, we were here, some of you may have been here on an earlier panel, and there was somebody asking a question where I felt really as a software developer uh, for a startup, they are feeling um, need, in need of support. Uh, the ecosystem does not support them very well. Um, you know, they can't get the people with the necessary skill, with the necessary capacities. Uh, they don't know how to actually, even if they are aware of the guidelines or aware of the requirements, uh, applying them is quite difficult. Um, so there's a multitude of issues here that need to be broken down, that need to be addressed holistically. And I think this is also reflecting back to policies. Policies are really good uh, in a way. <laughs> Unfortunately, I must say, I think policies are probably, you know, the, the single most driver for accessibility, even for the simplest thing like a curb cut. So um, where, you know, where, where people would assume the economy of scale and the ease of doing that, of, of, of lowering the sidewalks so that wheelchair users and bicycles and everything, there, there's so much return on investment and it's fairly simple. But even um, things like that have not been implemented or do not get implemented until actually laws and regulations uh, come in place. So on the one side, laws and regulations are incredibly important. On the other hand, they kind of drive developers into, they give a bit of a negative spin. <laughs> you have to do that, otherwise you'll get fined. You'll have to do that. And then you get the reaction of, okay, what is the minimum that I have to do to meet the, 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 the policy, to get by? You know, you're, 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 um, it, it, it creates a little bit of this tension of uh, people having an association that I have to do that. We talk very often about the three carrots and the stick. <laughs> so all the benefits of doing accessibility, but um, trying to have uh, policies and, 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 and legal frameworks that are more encouraging rather than, um, uh, I mean, they need to police and they need to enforce, but in a, in a way that also support uh, the individuals. Maybe a, an example, one of the things in the European Web Accessibility Directive that was mentioned also by Clement. There's not only the component of the technical standard and that member states of the European Union have to monitor, but there's also a component that they have to provide training and education to help the skills of their uh, government bodies uh, in order to be able to meet these standards. So th this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about, having kind of broader set policies that not only set a target, uh, but also help um, help individuals and organizations m meet that target in practice. 
and I'll stop there and I think we're going to have more discussion. Um, thank you, Shay. Maybe, Mohamed, you want to continue? Uh, thank you, Clement, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And a big thanks to uh, French Digital Council, who enabled my participation in IGF and this panel. Uh, Shadi talked about W3C standards and policies. I uh, would like, uh, for instance, to step uh, to step back a bit more. And and uh, if if the title of the of the workshop, someone uh, if it offends you somewhat, the accessibility for disabled people. So personally, I do not subscribe, and I'm, I, I apologize that. The, by the time I came to know of it, that disability uh, for disabled people was used, so it was too late to change. So it was not intentional, but uh, primarily uh, the, the translation, when proposal was written in French, and then it was translated into English, so something wrong happened. Uh, according to United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the, the convention which, which we, uh, most persons with disabilities subscribe to and, and promote, and, and we intend that it should be implemented, implemented in right and spirit in different states. Uh, that gives the right that it's the person which is more important and not the disability. So, so person should come first rather than the disability. So it's people or person with disabilities, and disability is not something uh, which, is, which can be sympathized. It is a social condition. Uh, due to the barriers in the society, people have impairments like physical impairment, visual impairment, hearing, and something like that. It's the societal barrier that make that person enable or disable. So, uh, it, it's like that. Uh, now coming to the, to the topic about, uh, and I will pick the thread from where Shadi left about policies. Uh, when we uh, make the policies and when governments make the policies, uh, in their infinite wisdom, sometimes it happens that they, they, they think that they are all knowing and they do not include the persons who upon whom those policies would be implemented. And sometimes uh, they, are, they are made wrongly, or sometimes the language reflects something which, which becomes difficult to change. So, uh, so, so as, a, as a president of Accessibility Special Interest Group, we strive that uh, the, the, the input of persons with disabilities uh, should be taken right from the start. And from the start, I mean uh, right from planning, implementation, and execution, and also of evaluation. So when you are planning for something, you need to take the input. When you are implementing it, you need to check it that how these policies or project is being implemented. And then you also need to take care of accessibility issues, and you need to think about it when you are evaluating uh, the project, that what were the outcomes, what were the indicators, is the project fit uh, and fulfilling the needs and requirements what were uh, set before the start of that project. So accessibility needs to be there. Uh, we, we will also talk about that how this, this favors person with disabilities uh, and we will also talk about that there is a difference between access and accessibility, and there is also a difference between uh, uh, accessibility and usability. But for now, I will stop here and send back the mic to Clement. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Mohamed. Um, Maria Ines, um, if you want to continue. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here to talk about accessible design. My objective in this panel is to argue the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the standard used in most national laws, are not enough to design accessibly and to propose some path to complement these guidelines. To answer uh, to that question, let me first give you some background on the classification of design knowledge. Um, According to SACLAT, design of an object, like a website, for example, is a 
two-dimensional space determined by a first axis, the dimension to be designed, and a second axis, the commitment mode of design stakeholders. The dimension to be designed can be the object form, the object function, the user experience, or the symbolic dimension. And the commitment mode of design stakeholders can be managed sequentially by design, design thinking or by participatory design. Let's focus on the axis of the dimension to be designed. According to Saklat, the design of the form makes the object concrete, real. It's the design of the object materiality. The design of the function is the design of the object utility. In other words, what real life problem the object will solve. The design of the function is also the design of the object usability, which means that it will be effective, efficient, and satisfactory. The design of the user experience is about practices and environments in which the object will be used. And finally, the design of the symbolic is the design of meaning, the most intangible aspect of the object. This leads me to my first point, which is that we can deal with the content form. If you look at the success criteria contained in principle one, perceivable, they deal with the content format, textual, non-textual. They deal with the content style, color contrast, display orientation, spacing. They deal with the content structure. All these aspects shape the content, create its, its digital materiality. The same for the principle robust. It deals with compatibility. Content must have a form compatible with user agents that is compatible with web browsers, media players, plugins, and assistive technologies. To do this, sources must be valid. It must have a correct syntactic and semantic form. And we can deal also with the content function. Success criteria contained in principle two, operable, are clearly related to the content usability. For example, the content must be keyboard accessible to function effectively. To work efficiently, it must provide a mechanism to bypass blocks of content. To satisfy user needs, multiple ways might, must be available to locate a web page within a website. And success criteria contained in principle three, understandable, are also related to the content function, since the user need to understand how to operate the content. And for that, the content must be comprehensible, predictable, and the errors must be well managed. In short, we can cover design of the form and design of the function, but uh, nothing is said about design of the user experience or design of the symbolic. Sorry. As in literature, you can find path for design and accessible user experience. I prefer to talk here about accessible design of the symbolic. How to design accessible content meaning. We have to start from the postulate that behind an interface or a web content, there is always an owner who has a purpose regarding the interface audience. The owner is the one who initiates, promotes, edits, and keeps alive the web content over time. This communicative purpose of the owner determines the content meaning. As an illustration, let's, let's take this article from the United Nations website. It's a chronicle conversation with one of the authors of a UN report regarding accessibility to UN meetings. At the beginning of the article, we find this picture, which has the following textual equivalent, a round table meeting taking place during the 10th session of the conference of state parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Does this textual equivalent reflect the meaning of the picture? For me, and probably for you, no. And why? Because the communicative purpose of the owner, in this case, the United Nations, is to emphasize that people with disabilities can now correctly take part on UN meetings. And that's the reason why two women in wheelchairs appear in the foreground of this picture. So, a meaningful textual equivalent could be, for example, 
women in wheelchairs are properly installed at the UN meeting about the rights of persons with disabilities. The symbolic dimension explains why it is difficult to automate accessibility conformance tests. An automatic evaluation tool can easily detect that an image has no textual alternative, but it, it cannot yet, to my knowledge, discern whether a textual alternative reflects the communicative purpose of the owner. Uh, I don't, I, Yes? So, let's now turn to the commitment mode axis of the classification. That is, who to engage in the design project. According to SACLAT, a design project can be conducted in a traditional way, that is, a design team that follow a sequential process, usually an analysis phase, a design phase, and an evaluation phase. Or we can use a design thinking mode there is a design team that follows a non-linear iterative process which seeks to understand users, challenge assumptions, redefine problems, and create innovative solutions. Or we can do participatory design, that is a design team that co-design with end users. All stakeholders are actively involved in the design process. So which of these three modes of commitment will be the most suitable for accessible design? Me uh, and others think that uh, participatory design is the mo most appropriate methodology because design is a process of inscribing knowledge in material forms and users, people with disabilities in this case, know better than anyone the real situations in which the, the object will be used. Furthermore, integrating the know-how of people with disabilities is the only way to design the user experience dimension. But users are not the only experts in accessibility. Relevant stakeholders for accessible participatory design are all those people with some knowledge in the object that will be designed. This defini definition extends the classic triad, developers, content users, to a wider network show in, in the slide. On the production side, we have ICT professionals, the owner, sponsors, and third-party contributors. On the youth side, we have people with disabilities and their attendants. People with disabilities are experts in what Frauenberg calls the disabled experience, they are specialists in the use of assistive technologies and can configure them in very different ways. They have knowledge derived from the rheological condition, for instance, within the collective of people with visual impairments. Blindness is, is not the same as low vision. Birth blindness is not the same as acquired blindness. And some knowledge is intrinsically cultural. For example, sign language is the language of a deaf culture. Attendants of people with disabilities, family, colleagues, teachers, caregivers, and others, are also key informants in the design process. They have a deep knowledge about the disabled experience, about the needs, habits, and preferences of people with disabilities. ICT professionals, that is developers, designers, QA professionals, and others, are experts in design the content form and the content function. To do this, they use and are experts in the use of authoring tools such as development environments, content managed systems, as well as evaluation tools to check the content accessibility. As I said before, the owner is the one who best knows the communicative purpose and the one who will propose the content meaning. Bringing the owner together with users is the only way to design the symbolic di dimension. In some cases, the owner does not finance the design process, but there are sponsors. And sponsors should ideally participate in design because they manage financial resources and because they often condition the project agenda. External contributors have knowledge about the specific content they provide and are responsible for their accessibility. To summarize, I recap <laughs> my main points. WICAR, WICAC, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, are not enough to design accessibly 
as they deal only with the content form and the content function. The content communicability, its ability to meaning the owner purpose, could become a fifth accessibility principle in order to keep symbolic dimension in mind. A participatory approach to accessible design is an alternative to design guides simply by standards as it brings together all people with some expertise in the object that will be created. And I think that more re research on accessible design is needed, especially in symbolic and participatory design. This will be use useful for training, for public actors, and for those who develop standards. That's it from me. Um, <clears throat> if someone has a comment or a question, feel free to intervene. Um, otherwise, I will give the mic to Shadi. Uh, maybe you have some remarks on the topic? I always have remarks. Uh, <laughs> So, um, I fully agree with the conclusion. <laughs> I really have a lot of troubles with the argumentation uh, getting there. So, um, absolutely, WCAG describes the properties of content. What does it mean for content to be accessible? It doesn't talk about the process, it doesn't talk about the policies, the environment, all these things around that you need uh, to, um, in order to do. So we fully subscribe to participatory design. We have resources called involving users mm -hmm. throughout the design and development process in evaluation and, and, and throughout. And so we, we, we try to communicate that very often that standards are a tool to help you meet a purpose, but they are not the end goal in itself, right? Uh, accessibility is a journey, not an end point, uh, roughly said. Um, where I do want to contradict maybe a little bit is um, actually um, the requirement for text alternatives says the text alternative has to serve the purpose. So, no, it has to provide the purpose also for the labels. And uh, so I think the onset, Um, we can dig it up. <laughs> the idea is that, no, I mean, you know, if, if you talk about, say, uh, let, let's take a different example, the, the instructions or providing labels, and this I'm sure labels provide uh, the purpose, explain yes. the purpose. So there are many aspects that do relate to the user experience. I would really contradict the aspect, this absolutism, that it doesn't uh, address uh, user experience at all. I think that's a very, very uh, long stretch, and it doesn't, I think, uh, do any good to be taking this um, fairly controversial approach uh, to prove a point which I think we can all agree with, that a participatory design and inclusive design process is beneficial and makes it easier to achieve this purpose, uh, to provide the content that serves not only the end user, but the broader, um, the, 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 so, so not only people with disabilities who it, it serves for, but actually the broader audience. So, um, um, yeah, let's, let's leave it there. The problem is not in the, in the standard, but in, in laws that say uh, for being accessible, you must uh, be uh, conform with this standard. And that's all. And there is uh, nothing to say about uh, how to do that in the standard, in the standard. Uh, when the standards say uh, the textual equivalent uh, must have uh, the same function than, than the picture, they don't say the function of what. <laughs> or, or, um, uh, they don't mention the, the, the owner, the person who communicates. And I think that that uh, will be important because uh, when, when you read the standard, uh, you don't understand automatically that the, the function is in relation with uh, the, the owner or the, the person who communicates through the interface. I think we have a question here. Yes. Uh, 
my name is Arlette. I'm working for the German Development Corporation and I would be interested in getting your advice because uh, uh, we are in the process of designing a project that uh, will uh, include um, expanding the local services to online services uh, and there is a special focus on including people with disability. Um, so, do you have any advice on, uh, I mean, there are various, various, um, I mean, even, I think everybody who is a user of online services is currently not properly included, that's, the uptake shows it's very low, um, but there are these various different groups that probably have to be included in different ways. I don't know, if you have any ideas on that, I would be thankful. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for the question, and that's very uh, appreciable approach. Uh, at the outset, I should I should say that uh, that French government has taken that uh, they want to include the person with disabilities in their online services as well. Uh, what my recommendation would be to to engage actual persons with disabilities. Of course, you should go about uh, in a structured way and, and talk about some, some organizations who are operating in, in the German uh, federal, German territories uh, that, and, and are working for persons with disabilities. Uh, but ensure that actual person with disabilities, those who are actually impacted impacted are there as a uh, to give the user feedback on whatever services you are uh, you are having or you are applying uh, for instance uh, in in pakistan last year we uh, formulated our government formulated the it policy uh, and the policy the purpose uh, was it, it took like uh, one and a half or more years to formulate that policy and one of the good things in that policy was that actual input from person with disabilities were were taken and it was incorporated in the in the policy final document it now has a has a complete chapter that addresses the issues and gives some recommendations uh, that addresses the issues of people with disabilities so similarly uh, now uh, when the government is in the in the formulate of uh, formul in the process of formulating an operational document on that policy uh, the government is uh, trying to include person with disabilities and in this case here i would like also to invite uh, person with disabilities who are in in the german territories uh, they should also come forward and and uh, provide their inputs because it's them uh, after the services are completed they are online uh, it's them who will be impacted. For instance, let me just give you an example that a website may be accessible but not usable. Uh, I, uh, as, a, as a citizen of Pakistan, have to uh, obtain visa to enter into uh, Shenzhen territories. So it was Shenzhen visa. I went there to apply for, uh, uh, for Shenzhen visa in the German embassy. I was asked to apply for the online appointment. So I filled the complete form. Uh, it was a one, two pager, three pager form. I filled all the requirements and at the end of that uh, form, there was this image, CAPTCHA image, uh, which, which did not had an, uh, an alternate option to, uh, for me to, uh, to fill in. So it was an image which I had to read myself and then uh, fill in in the, in the relevant column. You all, uh, I think you all are aware of that, that function, which verifies that it's the human who is accessing that website. Uh, it would have been more prudent if there was an alternate. So I had to get a, a cited help to just pass through that single step. Otherwise, I had completed all the form. It was accessible, but just because of a single, single step, I was unable to submit that form. So this could be one of the reasons and this, the, the small things, yes, we all want to talk about the big things, but there are small things which may really impact your, your accessibility and usability processes. So I hope this answers your question. Yeah, I think uh, to, to add absolutely involving people with disabilities throughout the design and development process, the participatory design approach, 
that was taken. I think that's 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 really important. Um, one of the things that I think is is, is really helpful is um, getting developers uh, and, and designers to actually watch a usability test or watch people with disabilities actually use. Uh, this is so impactful uh, because when we talk about accessibility, very often it's so abstract. It's a term. Most people have not actually seen somebody using a mouse stick or a head stick or somebody uh, who has, say, dyslexia and really, you know, tasks that the developers, you know, this is a soft, you know, a, a, an IT problem since long ago. <laughs> It's not a new thing that developers develop for themselves. I mean, it's easy. Alt, uh, control Alt F4, right? I mean, who invents that, right? <laughs> developers, right? And it's easy, you know. The, the, uh, but they think, right? Um, I am an IT nerd as well, so, so I can I can make fun of them. Um, so um, you know, when 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 you then see how your your users are actually not completing tasks that seem fairly simple, like find the phone number of the, <laughs> the, the office or the opening hours or something, and, and they actually see which issues. I've, I've seen developers you know, behind the glass in usability lab you know, wanting to knock on the glass and say, press the button there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and then the light bulb goes off and then they understand um, I, I don't like using the word empathy because that's not what it's about, but really understanding that we all have different approaches, different experiences of using the content, using the web. And when that comes through, then actually you get developers very motivated. Developers love to solve problems. Uh, <laughs> then they're engaged and they don't feel that this is an obligation. They have to meet something that is abstract but they're actually being challenged. Hey, can you make your product better? Uh, and um, so I, I, I think that's another part of involvement that I think really um, goes very long. And the other thing is also, um, even though again, I'm all for standards and everything, and I know right now in Europe, a lot of member states have this pressure because of the directive and they have to meet it. And um, you still have to be practical. Some organizations, unfortunately, have not done anything for years and years, even though it's been a requirement. And to now expect that they will, you know, in one shot become accessible. Again, you know, I repeat, accessible accessibility is a journey. It's a mindset. It's, you know, integrating into the process. Um, and that will not happen overnight. And you need to be pragmatic and you need to prioritize um, in certain situations. Um, and. Um, uh, yeah, try to really, uh, one thing for example in, in, in the Netherlands, um, you know, if you don't meet the requirement, you have to explain why you don't and provide a plan for how you plan to actually, and I think that's very sensible because there are situations where you're, for whatever reasons, right, um, but if you can explain that, if you can justify it and if you can provide the plan for how you want to, to, to improve that, I think that's a more sensible kind of, um, a policy that, that is building in a little bit of um, encouragement rather than being a very rigid, um, you know, on or off uh, kind of approach. Um, if I may add something of the, on, on this topic and on participatory design, uh, the French Secretary of Digital Affairs just announced the creation of an experts committee uh, composed of user and notably users with disabilities. Uh, of researchers, of uh, web developers, of, web, of graphic designers, um, in order to identify practical difficulties um, of the digitization of public services. Um, so maybe a good way to improve uh, web accessibility beyond standards is to implement uh, directly in the law or um, through public policies, um, some, um, some committee like that or some spaces uh, in which uh, people will exchange on this topic. Um, and when we interviewed the uh, web developers, um, some of them said that uh, it, will, it would be very important for them to 
have a better knowledge of uh, how people with disabilities are using the internet. So it could be very useful for everyone. Um, speaking about uh, web developers or like uh, I, the IT sector, um, another point we I, I raised in my introductions in, in my introduction, sorry, is the lack of trainings uh, among um, the IT sector. So, Mohamed, if you want, uh, can you? Can you talk about um, the experiment you participated, your, you participated in uh, in Pakistan, uh, please? Uh, thank you, Clement. Uh, thank you very much. And that was uh, really an interesting experiment that we we did. Uh, so what happens that uh, in back in December last year we had this idea that we should get together uh, some regional countries and their representatives and have a regional forum on accessibility. And the Islamabad chapter uh, the, of the Internet Society, of which I am a member of board as well, uh, we hold a, a one-day conference in which we invited the South Asian chapters, uh, a representative of theirs to come uh, to that, that uh, forum and share their experience on accessibility. Uh, one of the outcomes of that forum was that we should have, uh, uh, we sh so lack of training was the, was the factor, that a lot of the websites in, in uh, our part of the world, our region of the world is, is uh, lacking. So what could be done about that? So one of the idea that came up was that the government people, they are not mostly aware of the accessibility and the accessibility requirements. So they need to perhaps be trained. Uh, and what we did that uh, Internet Society Accessibility SIG and again with the local participation of Islamabad chapter, Internet Society uh, took a step uh, to bring in external help and accessibility trainer in Pakistan and put uh, the government officials, uh, not the officials who are at the policy level, but the, but the developers, actual developers who develop the government websites. And the, the developers from the civil society as well as some uh, people with disabilities under, uh, under one roof for three days and uh, we tried to uh, make them sensitize about the about how what is the need and how to make those uh, websites accessible and uh, we followed the approach that was the participatory method and it was essentially the wcag uh, 2.1 guidelines that we were following that how to make website accessible how to code what's the what what is the process what are the indicators and in, in all that stuff uh, the, the purpose was of twofold. One was to raise the awareness about general community, about the government and civil society and also in the personal person with disabilities that this is a thing that we now need to, uh, to act upon because if it is delayed, so we know there are uh, disparities and there are divides uh, in the haves and have nots of the world. So uh, while the virtual domain mostly is formulated, if, if uh, we do not act now, uh, the divide on in the virtual domain, and let me tell you, it is a great equalizer. Virtual domain is a great equalizer. I, when I connected um, to the internet, I'm not a person with disability. I am a person who is connecting through the machine. So practically, a developer has to make the machine able to, to read that uh, that what is coming in front of that machine for me. So it's a great equalizer unless we, we developers uh, and, the, and the technical community and the policy guy do something about that. So uh, this was the purpose and the next step uh, we are hoping that the, at least the government developers, they would do something to make the official websites of government of Pakistan accessible. So we have, uh, we have recognized a number of websites, at least five in the first stage that we would support if, if, they, if they go to that step and we are persuading the policy guys to go to that step because uh, you know there are a number of processes when you want to change something at the government level. So we are trying to persuade that at least five of the websites should be made at mo as model website and should be made accessible 
uh, those websites uh, could be uh, some of the job portal, some education websites, or uh, of the of the Ministry of Information Technology and or the telecom regulator, which which are actually being used by the persons and not just by the people with disabilities, but by the general public as well. So there are a number of services. They are uh, day by day going online, and if if the we'll we'll have to see that if government of Pakistan would implement on that. Uh, of course, we will try our, our best to uh, persuade them, and we hope for the best. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Shabir. Uh, this is Vakas Hassan. I'm from uh, Internet Society, Pakistan chapter as well, the so same one where Shabir comes from. So um, yes, this project um, has been and will be quite useful because um, government services being uh, accessible uh, will always lead the way in making, attracting more users to online. But I just want to note thoughts of the panel on, on, on another thing, what is, which is that uh, more often than not, uh, the purpose of making, uh, of, of digital accessibility should be to make the person with disabilities self-sufficient, um, economically being an earning hand for, for their families as well, rather than thinking of these and what they so-called the charity work. But when you talk to private sector about this, um, they probably don't see much of a business case in making a website accessible. They, they, they basically are cost-benefit companies which work for profit. Uh, do you think, um, or are you aware of, if, is, there any, is there a lack of academic research on this topic which actually finds out a delta that when once you make a website or websites accessible for persons with disabilities, what kind of economic impact it has on uh, on the person's ability to earn, or his family's ability to earn, or city's region, nation, uh, is there any academic literature available on this, and is there a lack of uh, lack of it uh, which exists? So, and how to address it? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Indeed, I think I mean g governments do have to do impact analysis, so there is some data available on on uh, return, but it is very patchy and very lacky, and I think this is really an area for more research to demonstrate that. Um, there are many cases, many examples that show we have anecdotal cases. Um, uh, for example, an online store uh, in the UK, I won't disclose names, that was forced to make their website accessible, uh, so to say, you know, with a, with a court uh, threat. Uh, with a lawsuit threat, and um, I think the numbers, and this is this is a while, so don't quote me on this on, on, on the numbers, but I think it was something like thirty-five thousand pounds to make you know to make the repairs that were necessary, which was back at the time quite a lot of money. But what and and they were thinking that they will get that back in in, in four years. Um, they saw that the revenue increased by I think it was like two point one million or something. So it was exorbitant. Okay, this particular example was an online store, so it was really, <laughs> I'm on mic now, stupid, <laughs> to, to, you know, be an online store and not consider making, you know, something not only accessible, but actually usable. So, um, you know, and, and, and it's not a wonder that when they made it better that, you know, people wanted to use that service, but it was too difficult. Um, and we see this lack of uptake of digital technology, not because, you know, per se people don't like it, but because technology very often is difficult. Try to explain to, to, to somebody, you know, how to do online, you know, go online and, you know, get your, 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 uh, your passport or your visa or something, you know, you find yourself very often actually wanting to go there and, and speak to a person just because it's so difficult. Um, anyway, so, so um, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence of benefits, um, but I think more research in that area would be really helpful, would be really good. Um, and and um, if, if that's something you're thinking about, I would really encourage you to. Uh, Mohamed, you want to react on that question? Uh, I just want to add to what uh, rather substitute what Shadi has uh, said about the research and uh, about data. Yes, to I have tried to to look for such cases and such data, but 
again, this is these are uh, some conjectures which which we can talk about, but we cannot be sure about that how it 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 is. Uh, but I would like to draw the audience attention to to another point because one day you may be good or you may be all right with with one page which has no uh, big fonts, which has no uh, uh, which has colors which are like flashy or something like that but there may come a day because human do not remain the same every day it's it's ev an evolution and and as in the earlier session it was highlighted that aging and all that stuff so so it's not just person with disabilities who who just uh, benefit from the from the accessible design or universal design it's the whole community as we have been saying it again and again so uh, and and that's that's probably one of the reasons that you it would be difficult to have a really quantitative data on of course i would be really interested in in having that data uh, and it would be really uh, supporting the point or or, or or would be encouraging us uh, for instance there are certain assumptions uh, let me tell you uh, which which sometimes we need to uh, we need to disrupt for instance uh, before 2014 in Pakistan, uh, banks would not allow persons with visual impairment to, to access the internet services, to carry credit cards, debit cards, or use SMS uh, banking facilities, etc. And one of their core argument, you know what was that? And the argument was that if we allow persons with disabilities to carry credit cards and all that stuff, debit cards, it's easier to cheat them. Now, uh, as, a, as a technology guy, uh, you may think that it's a very silly idea, but it was so ingrained in the, in the banking sector's mind that it took, like, it took us like seven years, 2008, uh, late 2008 to till, till, till 2014. Uh, we had a number of meetings with the Central Bank, uh, State Bank of Pakistan, to just convince them that uh, carrying or opting for these facilities does not make person with visual impairment insecure, rather it makes them secure. Because what alternate they had was that if a person wants to uh, deposit some cash in the bank, they, they can go alone and deposit some money. But if, if they want to withdraw some money, from the bank, which was their own earned money, they will have to take a person with them who will witness, who will witness sign on behalf of person with disabilities as yes, X, Y, Z amount was withdrawn from the bank. So practically it was not for the benefit of persons with visual impairment, rather it was, the, it was for the benefit or rather uh, extra cautionary measures on the behalf of bankers so that they do not get into, the, into trouble. And, and uh, this was one uh, we, we had to really, uh, by the backdoor channels and by using our connections, we have to get that, those ATMs and credit cards by ourselves. And then we were only able to convince them that, no, uh, you see, we have been using these services for such and such uh, time, and we did not have any incident, any bad incident. So this is not about the insecurity, it's, it's also about the privacy because if I am taking Shadi with me to withdraw some cash and he is signing on behalf of me as a witness, at least he knows how many, how much cash I would, I withdraw. So, so this is, this is not just about uh, the service, it's, it's about the thought process and very, very apt point earlier it was highlighted that you need to hit that where is the thinking process coming from? Uh, that's why I ask that it's the policy, planning, and implementation. And I do not uh, want to put a burden on, on new starters to, to have their websites accessible right from the beginning and, and AAA accessible right from the beginning. But if they do, they would be benefited. If they don't, uh, well, if if uh, we can have a, we can have a limit such as such as we can say if a, a business has like uh, 10 million of revenue or 10 million of value so those businesses websites or or uh, products would have to be made accessible so there can be a bar and and policy can guide us in that uh, 
uh, if if not, there is no end to it because uh, without regulation, without laws, our people do not want to. Uh, so it's very difficult. Yes, it's it's very it seems very beautiful and very uh, it seems like very generous to talk about morality and accessibility and we want to do all that stuff. But sometimes uh, it's the WIP WHIP that you need to to have the businesses motivated. And this was one of the cases. So, so uh, if if you allow me, I would name a company uh, with uh, Domino's. Uh, they had li they have like uh, 17 or 16 uh, kind of methods uh, with which you can order pizzas. But uh, one of them, their website was not accessible, uh, and and in America they were sued, and the lower court it decided in the favor of persons with visual impairment. And Domino's took the case into the higher court. And this was one case decided back in July uh, 2019 in the favor of persons uh, with visual impairment. The point is, it, it was just one option which was not accessible. There were other 16 options accessible, but it's, it, when it comes down to accessibility, it also comes down to the choice of the people that what choice do out of those 16 or 17 or 15 or whatever X, Y, Z methods he or she wants to take. So sometimes, so, so Domino is not a small company. It can, it can make uh, that kind of decision and it, 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 it is now forced to, to make their, uh, all the delivery methods and all the uh, ordering methods accessible. So, so we we will have to do something about about uh, these kind of policies and plannings and implementations. And of course, I come down again back to the uh, the evaluation processes that we do. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from the audience? Yes. Uh, just a a small one. Um, We've been going around all afternoon here. I'm Peter Crosby. I'm uh, autistic. Just in regards to the um, this question of of standards um, and the the necessity or the role of participation is that the standards uh, you um, I've forgotten your name is it Maria um, pointed out the, the the point three there about understandable. There's a word there predictable. My version. Are predictable as an autistic person and your version of predictable have nothing to do with each other. And the only way of testing if a website is predictable is to get someone like me to look at it. So in terms of uh, certainly cognitive disabilities, you, you, you have to have those people. And I see site after site that's supposedly accessible, it, you can see straight away that it's going to uh, present barriers to a, a lot of people simply because they haven't been asked. Um, and just another, just a, a great comment that Mohammed made about the passport application getting to the end. It, so much of this stuff is it's small things. It's just small changes. And it's these, these small things that are forming these sort of roadblocks, especially when they build up through a site or through an app. If you just, you, maybe you get past the first one, perhaps the second one, but by the time you get to the third one, you've just had enough. Uh, and it, accessibility doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be understood. And certainly, you have to speak to the people who are using these, these sites and apps and so on. Uh, some, some of you want to react on that? feeling very controversial today. Uh, <laughs> I've already been told that I'm not very diplomatic, so. <laughs> uh, the guidelines are in no way perfect, and there is need for improvement. We are continually working on them. There's a version 2.2 in parallel, also a third generation, in which we want to change the conformance model. One of the issues is that because accessibility requirements have to be testable and you have to say when you've met it and when you have not met it. This is 
a technical specification has to be unambiguous, it gets very difficult to have certain types of requirements that are um, uh, where the personal needs and personal preferences are sometimes very difficult to distinguish. So in particular, the area of cognitive and learning disabilities where there's also more research needed and, and ongoing to better understand the needs. There are, you know, cognitive and learning disabilities is such a big group um, that, that I think it's maybe too, too much of a term. So there are certain types of disabilities there that are better understood than others. There are certainly different, uh, you know, if we go into uh, mental health and, 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 and uh, uh, behavioral disorders and things like this, that the, the scope is really broad and it becomes really, really difficult to specify specific requirements and say met and not met. But it's an ongoing process and I think, you know, this is where we try to have a community-based and open process where we love participation from all sectors. We use a multi-stakeholder um, approach to involve um, different people with disabilities in the process, industry, research, uh, government. We need to have all these experts in the discussion to try to define requirements. Now, um, regarding involving users, absolutely. It's essential, it's important, it, there, there's, I think, no way past it. If you really want to make a good user experience, there is no way past. But I don't think it's one or the other. I don't think it's either involving users or using standards. I think the two need to complement each other. And I think this is the more optimal way forward. Uh, because there are also challenges and difficulties with involving users. I've heard this so often, you know, when you come and say, you know, this is not accessible, and I'm sure Shabir, you've heard it before, say, well, I don't know, my neighbors, uncles, you know, whatever, um, you know, said it's fine, you know. <laughs> so they, they asked the user, and the user said it's fine, you know. Uh, so you need to define very strong process, you know, who do you ask and how do you ask, and, and this is not something that is uh, trivial. Uh, how to involve people, it needs usability professionals, trained people who know how to actually carry such out a methodology. So at the end, I would argue if you only follow one approach, you will likely equally end up with big gaps. Um, and the same if you only follow the standards without involving the people. So that's why I'm saying you really need to combine the two. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question I can read to you from the participants online, if you like. Um, so the question is, how do you make an organization aware to make opportunities for advocates as accessibility champions in an organization? Yes. Could you repeat that question? Sorry. How do you make an organization aware to make opportunities for advocates as accessibility champions in an organization? So, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think it, it has to be the organizational approach, one, and second, it has to be some participatory method that, that we uh, talked about in the beginning. Uh, so accessibility champion, having accessibility champion is, is a good thing, but I would say uh, accessibility advocate, having an accessibility advocate at an at a organization uh, would be more prudent. Uh, why? Because an accessibility advocate would be the one who knows what accessibility is, what are the requirements, and what ought to be or what should be done, do's and don'ts. So champ, having champion is, is, uh, is whereas it's, it's a good sounding word, but I would definitely not support uh, that, that kind of approach. Advocate and advocacy is, uh, for me, it, it would be much more important. Perhaps uh, some other, someone else on the panel have some different views? No different view. I, 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 I'm not sure exactly how to understand it. I, I, I think, uh, well, I guess there's two sides. There's one uh, kind of like 
externally prompting organizations, and there are many different examples. I um, think in the Netherlands, for example, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> just, just again picking the Netherlands, uh, there was, uh, I think some years ago, where they had like ambassadors uh, through a disability organization where they really went from organization to organization, really door to door, knocked on their you know, CEO's door and, and uh, went in and showed them the difficulty they're having using their website. Um, and, and, and they really targeted you know, certain types of organizations and, and, and they just did a lot of that advocacy work. So I don't know, you know, so that's maybe one side. And then there's the reaction to it. So there's the organization internal and unfortunately, accessibility very often uh, is dependent on champions who kind of lead that internally within organizations who move it along. Um, and sometimes there's a culture where such, um, um, so, so, so there's you know discussion, particularly in tech organizations, how many hackers you should have on your team. Um, you know, people who are disruptive, people who don't follow the policies and the conform, because they bring innovation and they bring some, some interesting aspects very often. So there is actually sometimes a balance when you specifically want to have people who kind of swim against the stream, uh, so to say. Um, and if there is an organization with such a culture that is more accepting, you know, somebody comes with a new idea and says, hey, you know, this accessibility thing, we should actually really do more, um, whether than they're, you know, um, approached with, no, shut up and do your work, <laughs> or they're approached with, hmm, you know, tell us more, why don't you, you know, uh, go research that a little bit more. So, um, organizational uh, cultures are very important in how they react. So there's, I guess, an internal and external kind of um, uh, interplay here between, you know, the, the impetus that, that, that comes to, to, to generate uh, accessibility um, uh, awareness and, and interest in this. Uh, if moderator allows just one quick comment, uh, it's, uh, it, as Shadi said, come down to the approach. So some uh, disability rights organization, uh, those who are working for the rights for the person with disabilities, uh, can adopt an approach. I'm sure there would be in Europe, uh, some organizations would be adopting, but what I seen in, in Moscow when I was there back in January this year, uh, they have like different sort of concerts and uh, lunches and dinners in the dark so that people would be, uh, would be taken into a room where there is a total darkness. You would be guided to the seat by a visually impaired person themselves with a white cane and you would be even, it, it was a similar kind of uh, an example with the, with the meals. So the people who would serve, there would be no light in the room. It would be total blank out. So you would be served a meal and you would have to eat it like that. So it's kind of a feeler that to, to feel the people about that, how is, is uh, people with uh, disabilities uh, live and they, uh, they go about their lives. So there could be different approaches and there may be multiple reasons if someone does some more research, probably our knowledge on this may be uh, a bit low. Uh, but there could be different approaches that one can follow to, to make the society and different organization realize that there is accessibility and there is a need of it. Uh, I'm sorry, very respectfully to the, to the question that has been asked and what I have heard so far. I don't think that the companies or this idea of accessibility should be approached with the with, with the mindset that the company should be become champions of, of digital accessibility simply because they would do it just for the sake of their corporate social responsibility initiative or something that they would probably put in as put across as something they're doing for the society as a charity thing. I still firmly believe that if there is um, if there is a credible needs assessment. Um, and, uh, and a research done on the demand side of these services, uh, like the, the example that uh, that Sh Shadi uh, shared a few few minutes ago, uh, that is the only way that the companies would start taking this uh, this initiative and and this not not just initiative. This is the right this right seriously uh, for persons with disabilities. Uh, there are enough champions out there, honestly speaking, around the world. If you see, there are so many organizations that they are, which are working for for persons with disabilities. 
but in my opinion, that's the only way forward. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, maybe I wasn't clear. I'm at different stages of maturity, really, of adoption of accessibility. You start off very often with complete unawareness. Huh? People with disabilities use computers. Um, we still get that. You know, we still get that even in countries in which there has been, you know, accessibility regulations or you know, integrated classrooms or whatever. You still get this question uh, very often. So, so starting from 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 that point until you know the ultimate, and there are organizations that really embrace accessibility in their DNA, so to say, to, to, to put it, uh, where really throughout their policies, throughout their processes, how they hire, how they work, how they, I mean, workplace encouragement and, and, and things like this, how they create their website, how they procure, uh, you know, so, so th this is the top end. So between those extremes, there are kind of steps to get on the way. Um, some need more convincing and need hard data. Some, even when you present all the data, they still think there is no global warming, right? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you, you'll never convince, right? So, um, so uh, you, you know, the, the, there are different cultures and different kind of reactions to that. But very often, um, accessibility starts with an internal champion that kind of spearheads the way Unfortunately, it should be more systematic, as you say, complete agreement that the organization says, wait a sec, we're in 2019, nearly 2020, this is a UN convention, this is a human right and established by over 180 countries around the world. There should be no discussion about it, we shouldn't even be here talking about it, but that's not reality, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, just one comment. Uh, since we are talking about the new approaches to uh, to accessibility, uh, I think what is more needed in in uh, in more in our part of the world, uh, I am talking about Asia and Africa. Uh, we need to make uh, person with disabilities also realize that they also are to. Uh, opt for these kind of subjects. They also opt to go for the degrees in, in uh, science. Yes, it is difficult, but it is not impossible that as it was considered some days, uh, some years back when, when we were at the, at the defining stage of our career. Uh, today, I have seen uh, approaches in US that uh, there are certain scholarships, certain incentives and encouragements uh, for the students with disabilities who opt for such disciplines. So perhaps our governments can also think about, uh, about those kind of approaches and incentives for, for people with disabilities who want, and facilitating them also, uh, who wants to or want to opt for uh, this kind of disciplines. And while we are on the topic, perhaps uh, while the developed countries, they offer certain scholarships to, to different Asian and African countries, perhaps there could be more incentives for people with disabilities themselves, and particularly for those students who want to opt for these technical disciplines. Because this would really encourage people to, to study and this would provide them the environment where they can uh, get the education, they can get the training, and after that they can serve the community. I think we have another question. Uh... Yeah, I have a question. My name is Salman. I am from uh, Pakistan Telecom Authority. Uh, training the web developers is one part that is very essential. Why you are not thinking on developing a tool that can check your website is accessible and highlight the areas which need to be addressed? Like we check the vulnerability of the website in penetration testing, there can be a tool which can address these areas. Have you think on that or what? Absolutely, this, this is actually my, my favorite area of work. And uh, <laughs> we, we have a list online with uh, over 130 tools and there are many more that are not on the list. Uh, so there are many tools here from high-end, uh, there are uh, open source enterprise tools, all sorts of things. But, and this is really, really important, I think the example that Maria Ines brought up, 
is very telling. There are many things that you can check automatically, like that the image does not have a text description. Uh, um, but to actually assess how well the text description matches the equivalent purpose of the image um, <laughs> is, <laughs> is uh, something that um, needs for the time being, human evaluation, the R tool vendors were experimenting with AI. Uh, there are some, some things that can give you, for example, there is automatic captioning, image captioning in Facebook um, already, or uh, not captioning, sorry, uh, image, uh, image descriptions. Uh, captioning is on YouTube, uh, automatic captioning of YouTube. But you'll see the rate of quality, <laughs> how much there is need for still human intervention. So, it's not a fully automated process. There's still a lot of need. And actually, even in security, it's not. Yes, you run penetration tests, but you do need to also do lots of manual checks uh, as well. Um, and that's the same in accessibility. You can run tools, uh, automated checks, but you do need to do manual stuff as well. I think we have an online question. Yeah, it's the first time we're doing this, so I will, <laughs> we will give it a try. Yeah, I'm sorry, it seems to be audio issues, so I would just continue as before. Uh, is it possible for you to read the question directly instead of um, hearing the person? Oh, so since um, since it doesn't work, uh, I think we should uh, end this session. Uh, thank, thanks to all of you for your remarks and questions, uh, and thanks to our our experts. Um, I hope we will continue the discussion um, during the IGF. So and online, of course. So bye bye. <laughs>